It's 9 o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, just make sure you're in the right place. I'm going to be talking about PowerShell. This is very much going to be an introductory uh, session on PowerShell. So if you're already really familiar with PowerShell, um, it's probably going to be beneath you. So I'm going to try to cover a lot of the basics. There's a lot of material. Good chance I'll run over, but I'm going to do my best not to. Uh, but there's, it's kind of like trying to teach somebody C Sharp. It very much is a, a new programming language. So trying to get as much as I can into these slides. But uh, like I said, there's a lot of, a lot of information to cover. Uh, really quick about me, my name is Gary LaPointe. Uh, I'm a director and founding partner of Aptalon, just a small consulting company. Uh, we do everything from front-end deployments, uh, you know, governance to d custom development and whatnot. So I do a lot more than just PowerShell. It's just a tool. <laughs> um, I've been a SharePoint MVP since January 2008. Uh, my blog, uh, blog.fulchinconsultant.com. The, the focus of my blog tends to be primarily on uh, automating SharePoint. I, once in a while, I'll have a few other articles on various topics, but uh, I try to stick to PowerShell and basically just general automation. And I'm on Twitter. I don't use it very often. I'm not really into the social stuff so much. <laughs> uh, and if you have any questions that uh, if I can't get to them here, you know, just go ahead and, and tweet uh, the hashtag. I think, uh, I think this session is 312. So, uh, just go ahead and tweet it with that, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Or you can send me an email, which, sorry, I don't have my email up there, but uh, it's just Gary at Aptalon.com. So. And I have a book, uh, this book. So if you want to come take a look at it, too, I'll, I'll leave it up here. Um, its focus is on uh, PowerShell with SharePoint 2010. If you're doing 2013, it's actually still pretty relevant. Uh, there's I'd probably say maybe 90, 95% still relevant. Uh, some of the stuff on upgrade has changed. Uh, search service, uh, a web analytics service changed or gone. Uh, that's about it. Everything else is still relevant to 2013. So there's stuff that's obviously not there, like how to provision apps and some of the new services and whatnot. But if you're doing 2013 and you're trying to get into PowerShell, uh, I wrote it, so I'm a little biased, but I uh, definitely recommend it. <laughs> Uh, real quick, our agenda, uh, I'm going to start off going through some basic fundamentals. So this is kind of the stuff that you can do through the console. Going to then move on and start talking about, okay, now let's move into writing scripts, reusable code, code. and then I'm going to talk a little bit about PowerShell v3. I'm not covering SharePoint Online in here, uh, but I do want to point out that there are new um, commandlets available. So if you are working with SharePoint Online, there's a bunch that you can do there. And I have a blog post that I wrote. Let me just bring that. Sorry. Uh, so if you go to my blog, uh, go to the homepage, just kind of scroll down, and you'll find this article. So I talk a, a fair bit about the new commandlets that are there and what you can do. So like I said, if you are interested in SharePoint Online, you do have some options there now. This is the only time you'll see a browser in my demo. So there you go. Okay. All right, so first off, why PowerShell? Why do you care? Why should you learn it if you haven't already? <coughs> All right, for the IT pros in the audience, there are certain things in terms of provisioning in SharePoint that you can only do through PowerShell, and quite a bit more now in, in 2013 versus 2010. So there's a few things here and there, like a uh, simple example, a state service. Uh, you could do it through the farm configuration wizard, but don't ever use the farm configuration wizard for production. So 2010 state service, you had to use PowerShell to do that. 2013, there's a whole slew of new stuff that's the only way you can do it is to use PowerShell. So you've got to get comfortable with it. Repeatable operations, uh, you're uh, backing up site collections, you want to inspect your farm, whatever it may be, you, know, you can put these into a script, you can uh, rerun these over and over. A lot of it actually, in terms of repeatable operations, comes down to automated governance. Um, so I want to see uh, where my large lists are within a farm, uh, how many site collections I have, how big are they. Um, I can navigate and find that information out much quicker in PowerShell than I ever could through Central Admin. So a simple task like I want to find all of my site collections that are nearing that you know, uh, 200 gig threshold, right? I can write a very simple command that will give me all that information. And if I want, I could time that or tie that to a job, which will actually email me a report of that periodically. 
or I could upload that to a SharePoint list that will uh, that I can then set alerts to and whatnot. So there's a ton of stuff that you can do when it comes down to automating governance. For developers, um, I'm a developer. I do a lot of IT and infrastructure stuff, but people ask me what I do, I say I write code. Exploring the API, uh, inspecting live data, these are things I do all the time. I used to, you know, kind of back in the day, I'd create like a quick console app or uh, I'd use uh, some like code snippet compiler type things or whatnot. I don't use any of that anymore. So usually my tools, I got Visual Studio, Reflector, and PowerShell. So, um, Solution deployment, I mean, just going to production, you can only do you know, F5 deployment so much, right? So eventually you gotta move it to production. Well, you need to understand PowerShell to know how to do that properly, especially when it comes to <laughs> activating features across large sites and whatnot. Uh, and also just one-time setup configuration. I used to do a lot of stuff where, you know, web templates, site definitions, whatever, and you provision an environment, and you put tons and tons of code into these features for doing one-time setup for like a feature that may only ever be activated once. There are cases where that absolutely makes sense, but there are other cases where it makes more sense to just put that into a PowerShell script. It's a one-time thing, you move that, test that, deploy it, you never need to look at it again. And then again, automated governance, um, a lot of times somebody might come to you for some of these tasks and it may be quicker and easier to actually put them into a PowerShell script rather than creating a full-blown feature. Your deployment may be a lot simpler. I mean, yeah, you're, you're still running on the farm, it's still code, it should be tested and treated like code. Um, and that really goes for IT too. Remember, you're, you're writing code here. So just because you're an IT pro infrastructure or whatever and, and you're responsible for the servers, for the environment, as soon as you open that PowerShell window, treat that like Visual Studio because you are no longer an IT pro, you are a developer. So you need to treat any code that you're running as though it could ruin the farm, just like you would treat your developer's code, right? So good example, a lot of you guys know uh, the name Todd Clint, right? good friend of mine, right? He's an IT pro. Smart, smart guy, knows a lot about SharePoint. Went into PowerShell and I asked him if I could use this example a while ago and he lets me. So he uh, accidentally renamed all of his uh, SharePoint databases to SharePoint Config DB. <laughs> so just one little command, one little miss, and boom. So, I mean, fortunately, Farm still runs, but from SharePoint's perspective, they're all this, the same name. So a bit of a mess. I've seen people that have destroyed their farms before by just not being careful and not taking their scripts and running them into product, you know, test first before they go to production with them. Okay, so getting started. The first thing you need to do is open up the SharePoint 2010 or 2013 management shell. This is not a thing but a PowerShell console window. So if you actually looked at the properties on the shortcut to the management shell, it's just loading PowerShell EXE and then default in with a uh, script that SharePoint provides you when it uh, gets installed. That script is simply loading what's called a snap-in. Snap-in is just a collection, or it's really just a, a DLL that contains a bunch of classes which represent uh, uh, the commandlets that we're gonna run. So with um, SharePoint, I think we've got, uh, SharePoint 2010, there's roughly 500 uh, commandlets. Uh, with foundation, there's less uh, as a server. Uh, and uh, right around 800 with 2013. Uh, if you install my commandlets, you know, bump that up by about 100. So, uh, if you want to find out the commandlets that are available, there's a command that you can run. And I know you probably can't see this over on this side, but uh, it's a get command <coughs> dash ps snap in Microsoft SharePoint PowerShell. And I'll show this again, it'll be on the top of the slide. But, uh, but that'll list all the different commandlets that are available for you. And I'll show you what that looks like. It's, it's not the easiest to navigate, so there are some tricks to use in that. So if you're gonna run PowerShell, you need certain permissions to do it. First off, you need to be a member of the local WSS admin group. So this is uh, when you install SharePoint, or you can have WSS admin, uh, WSS, uh, WPG, uh, and uh, I don't remember the other one, I'm blank. But anyways, there's three groups, that uh, local groups that get installed specific to uh, WSS something. Uh, you need to be in this group and you need to be a member of the SharePoint Shell Access SQL role. You don't wanna be adding yourself to these directly. There's a commandlet to do it for you called add SP Shell admin. So 
what you'll do is you go down to the command prompt, to the, uh, the PowerShell prompt, and you're going to run this command. So here I'm just setting a variable called user, I'm giving it my username, and call an add SP shell admin, passing in the username. This first example here is going to give me access to the configuration database. So it'll let me do things like enumerate the number of site collections that are there. Um, I, might, I can list the web applications, work with web app applications, site collections, and whatnot. But I can't necessarily drill into the site collections. If I want to see site collections or uh, get access to some of the other databases like the services, I need to get the list of databases. So there's a command here called get SP database that gives me all the databases that I want. And then I'm going to, it's called pipe this, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but I'm going to pipe this into that add SP uh, shell admin command. So this will give me access to all the databases. If I do this, I don't need to do this because get SP database includes the configuration database. So, Uh, some commands, though, are also going to require additional permissions. You may need to be a local admin or a, a farm admin. For example, if you want to provision a web application, you need to be a local admin on the box. Uh, just the box that you're running the command on. It creates a timer job and provisions the, the web application on the other servers. So just wherever you're actually running the command is where you need to be that local admin. Once you're done, if you no longer need those permissions, there's the remove SP shell admin uh, commandlet. The trick with this one, though, is it does not remove it from this guy, so from the WSS admin uh, WPG group. And if you think about it, it makes sense because if I've, for instance, got two databases that I've been given access to and I want to remove access from one of them, if I removed it from here, then I've now broken my permissions. That said, it really wouldn't have been hard for them to just go and check to see, do I have access to another database? Okay, leave it in. If not, pull it, but there it is. All right, so now you're in PowerShell, and now you want to find out what you can do. You need to discover the commandlets that are available to you. So uh, we saw this earlier with the uh, with get in the list of commandlets, uh, get command. Uh, this is actually alias is GCM, so you, you can either type get dash command or just GCM. And if you type it alone, it's just going to give you a full list of all the commandlets, the SharePoint ones, the out-of-the-box window ones, and any other snaplet that you have available. And uh, this is... Uh, uh, the same example as before, which will basically just list the SharePoint specific commandlets. And again, if somebody has uh, installed extensions like my open source stuff that you've installed, these are part of the SharePoint commandlet. So if you run git command ps snap in Microsoft SharePoint PowerShell, you'll see my stuff as well. So that can actually get a little bit confusing if you've installed third party stuff and you're trying to differentiate between what's Microsoft and what's somebody else's stuff. There's no clear way to do that. Uh, you can use wildcards for that. So like say you're looking for, you know, you know there's a command to do some backups, but you don't remember what it is. I can do get command or GCM star backup star, and that'll just show me all the commandlets that have the word backup in the name. And there's other parameters you can pass to that. I can filter by verb, filter by name, uh, uh, module, which is a, a different type of a snap-in, if you will. Okay, you found your commandlet. Now you want to figure out how to use it. You'd use the get help commandlet for that. Uh, this is actually alias, is just help. So in this case, I found the backup SP site command. I want to understand how to use it. I'm typing get, SP, uh, get help, rather, uh, backup SP site. And I have some parameters I can pass in there. Uh, detailed examples are full. Uh, if you omit those parameters, it's going to give you a short synopsis. What's the syntax? What are the parameters that are available to me in description? Uh, but it won't give you any details about the specific parameters. Um, you know, like what are the, 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 what's the type, where does the description for that parameter, et cetera. And it's not going to give you the examples. So most of the time, if I'm trying to figure out how to use a commandlet, I just add this dash full. This will give me everything about that. So I can see all the commandlets, any related commandlets, the examples, everything. Uh, get member is another one uh, that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, so I'm just going to skip that one for now. And show command, this is new with uh, v3. I'm going to talk about that one later as well, but it's a great way in terms of discovery and figuring out how to use a commandlet. Okay. So now that you want to work with it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you take your commandlet name, all your parameters are going to be, you know, dash something. Some of the parameters are positional, so you don't actually need to provide the parameter name, you can just provide the value. 
don't get in the habit of doing that. I mean, it's simple in the command line where, you know, for some of the, the more simplistic commandlets like get SP site, you know, I want to just do get SP site and pass it the URL, that's fine. But when you start getting into some of the, the larger commandlets or writing scripts, you want to be a little bit more explicit about what you're doing because um, sometimes the position, the value that's there can, it may not be what you think it is. So I tend to, uh, like I said, in the command line, I tend to just short it and I might omit this and just provide the, uh, the, the address directly. But if I'm writing a script, I almost always put all the parameters in there. So the commandlets are not case sensitive. So I could have done all this lowercase or uppercase or whatever, it doesn't matter. And actually very little within PowerShell is case sensitive. Uh, so for your developers, as I start bringing back objects, you know, in C sharp, if I get an SP list, you know, it's gotta be, you know, capital S, capital P, capital L. Yeah, not so much in PowerShell. I can put all that lowercase, doesn't matter. And then the format, it's all gonna be verb noun. So I'm gonna do something to something. So I want to back up a site collection. Uh, there's a limited number of verbs, so there's actually some standards around that. And if you call get verb, you'll see what that uh, number is. This becomes probably most relevant when you think of things like delete. So how many different ways can I delete something? Can I delete it? Can I remove it? Can I destroy it? Right? Well, it's all remove. You'll never see the word delete anything. It's remove something. And uh, the nouns, I said they're always singular. They're almost always singular. So there are some exceptions there. I can't think of any at the top of my head, but there are a couple. And SharePoint commandments will always start with dash SP. Now, if you're doing SharePoint online, so Office 365 is dash SPO. And then I already talked about the parameters, but basically it's just gonna be dash something. So. Now there is some built-in protection against destroying things. So for instance, if I wanna remove a site, if I just call remove SP site and then pass in the URL of the site that I want to uh, uh, delete, it's gonna prompt me, do, do you wanna do that? Um, and I have to answer it. I can override that prompt, so I can pass in uh, dash confirm colon false. So there's this dash confirm parameter, this is an out of the box parameter, and what I'm doing is saying set the value of that to false. So there's a few places where, you know, if I do dash confirm alone, well it's still gonna confirm. I wanna turn that off. <laughs> That's how you do it. So it's basically just how you, this is what's called a, a switch parameter, and this is how I negate that switch parameter. I can also ask, what if I run this command? That what's gonna happen? In theory, that should work really well. And a lot of the out of the box Windows PowerShell commandlets do. So if I run that and you know, I wanna uh, uh, stop a service, for instance, and I pass what if in, it's gonna figure out, determine first whether the service exists before it gives me a success, a potential success message or failure message or whatever. Uh, not so much here with the SharePoint stuff. If I pass in what if, and I pass an URL that doesn't exist here, it's gonna say, yep, we would have deleted that site collection. You're good to go. So, okay, so great, I'm good to go. So I'm gonna remove that, and now I get an error. Say, so, yeah, that site collection doesn't exist. What are you doing? Right, so, SharePoint team, not so good with this. So I never, ever rely on that because you get a lot of potential false positives. Uh, tab expansion, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, as I'm typing along, I can hit tab pretty much at any point, just keep hitting tab or shift tab to go the other way and it'll just cycle through the available commandlets, parameters, paths, whatever. So if you're in the command uh, prompt or a script editor that uh, supports it, uh, so like uh, PowerShell V3, definitely, uh, most of the script editors do. Definitely saves you a lot of time. Just get used to hitting that tab key. You know, I can type uh, backup dash and it'll finish the rest for me. And then aliases, a lot of the common commandlets particularly have aliases. So if you're used to a command prompt, you've been doing STS-ADM. Um, how many here are still using STS-ADM? PowerShell. Um, but uh, so you're in the command prompt, you used to type in DIR for getting the directory, right? Or clear screen CLS to, to clear the screen. Uh, these are aliases in PowerShell, you can still use those, but they just map to other commandlets. So get child item is what DIR maps to. And get child item actually has a lot of other properties now that I can, or parameters that I can pass in and, and manipulate how that guy works. 
Um, and there's a few others here which I'll, I'll talk about later, but uh, just you know, you'll see lots of times where people are using, you know, instead of where object, they're using where or even just a question mark. It's all going to the same thing. It's all going to where object. It's just an alias. Okay, the pipeline. I talked about this a little bit but, uh, earlier, but uh, yeah, the way PowerShell works, it basically just moves things from one stage to the next, and that's the pipeline. So when I call get SP site and pass it in uh, an URL, what's happening is it's taking the, the SP site object that gets returned by that, putting it in the pipeline. Now, in this case, if all I've done is call get SP site, the end of the pipeline, there's sort of an implicit one behind the scenes that says, okay, write out the two string or some formatted string of that guy to the screen. So you don't see the pipeline there, but it's there. It's still working. It's just kind of behind the scenes. Well, I can go and I can add items to that pipeline, as many as I want. And I do that by just using um, a, uh, the pipe symbol here. So in this case, I'm calling get SP site, pipe symbol, backup SP site and then you know, backing that up to a, to a particular path. So the cool thing is that I can do this on multiple objects. So I know you guys probably can't see this over here, but um, I'm calling get SP site, and here I'm getting back the uh, a collection of site collections. So give me everything under HTTP demo department slash star. So this is gonna give me all of the site collections that map that uh, managed path. It might just be one, there might be 100, I don't know. And then I'm going to pipe that to remove SB site. So this is going to iteratively uh, uh, basically loop through each of those site collections and delete them. Now in this case, because I didn't pass in the confirm false, it's going to prompt me for each one, which that would kind of suck. But um, okay, members. So when you are in PowerShell, everything is a .NET object. Everything. So PowerShell itself is a big, massive .NET object. So it's actually under the system.management.automation namespace, which means I can actually take PowerShell and embed it into my custom application if I want to. But everything is just an object. So when I, again, when I call get SP site, I'm getting back an SP site object. So again, uh, actually, how many here are developers? Okay, good, good percentage of you, all right. So you guys will understand most of, of this. Uh, objects have members, so I can have properties. So basically these are attributes uh, of that object, URL, title, web template, et cetera. And I can have methods, which are gonna be the actions. So as a, when you're working with PowerShell, you get a ton of commandlets, right? 800 with, with SharePoint 2013. But that's only gonna take you to a certain level. You know, for instance, there is no commandlet for me to get a list. So I can get a web, get SP web, but once I want to see the list within that web, I got I to gotta know the object model. I got to iterate through. I got to get the list collection and iterate through that. I do have a command that called get SP list that you can download with my extensions, but you know, amongst a bunch of other stuff. But uh, if you're working with PowerShell, it's not really enough just to know the commandlets that are available. You've got to be familiar with the object model. Uh, see, some of the common properties and methods there are some commandlets for. So, set SP site, for instance. Um, I can pass in, for instance, the URL to a site uh, collection and then set the owner. There's, I don't know, maybe five different properties that I can set there. Uh, maybe even less than that. I can't remember off the top of my head. So, there's not a lot. But if you're familiar with the SP site object, there's a lot that I can do with that, right? I mean, there's, I don't know how many, 30 properties, 40 methods, whatever. All right, so quite a bit of stuff. So in terms of discovering uh, members and properties, and as a developer, I use uh, these techniques a lot uh, just because it's quicker sometimes than going out to the SDK to figure out some of the, the, uh, the overloads for a method and, and whatnot. Uh, but I can use the get member commandlet, and I mentioned this earlier, it's alias is GM. So what I can do is take any object, so an SP site object, for instance, and I can pipe that into get member and it'll show me all the methods and properties that are available on that guy. Uh, in this case here, there's some additional parameters that I can use. So I'm saying just show me the properties, just show me the methods so you can filter the, the results that come back. So let's say I want to find out what members does an SP web expose, uh, what properties are available, what can I do? So here I'm calling get SP web, taking the URL uh, for that web and just piping it into get member and that's going to return back that list for me. 
This is where it gets a little tricky is what about a collection? So I've got, uh, what am I using? Yeah, the list collection here uh, as an example. If I were to pipe this into the get member commandlet, what it's gonna do is say, I got a collection of objects. This, this guy implements I enumerable. So I'm gonna go and actually uh, expand that guy. And when I call get member on this, so this example here, uh, get sp web earl dot list, pipe it into get member. I'm gonna get back the methods and properties for an SP list object, not an SP list collection object. So to get around that, instead of piping it into the commandlet, you simply provide, provide the uh, results via the attribute. So get member dash input object, and then you just pass in that SP web. Uh, the, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the list collection uh, as part of that SP web. Make sense? All right, so now I want to look at property values. So I've seen what properties are available, what methods are available. Now I want to actually see the data that's stored in there. To do that, we use a couple different techniques, but uh, select object is the most common. And this is alias to select. So what I can do here is I can pipe an object into this commandlet and basically just say, which properties do I want to show? Uh, and I can use a wildcard. So in this case here, it's saying, give me an SP web object and show me all the properties that are available. So it's just gonna give me a big table of key value pairs. Or if I wanna filter that down, I don't really wanna see all of them. I just wanna see maybe the title and the URL or something like that. Uh, so I can basically just do select and then the property name, any number. So here again, setting this to a variable and then I'm calling the, uh, the select object command and just return it back the URL and the web template. This is particularly helpful when working with lists as I'll show you during the demo. Some properties though, I gotta dig into them. So if you think of an SP site object, if I wanna look at the usage, how big is that guy? There is a usage property on the SP site collection object and that guy then has additional properties. There's a one called storage, which tells me how big it is and then there's additional uh, properties that tell me about uh, sandbox solution quotas and all that kind of stuff. So if I just wanna get the storage, like how big is that site collection? I can't just do select usage.storage. PowerShell doesn't understand that. So what I have to do is uh, either use basically a script block. So anything in the, the curly braces, it's called a script block. So what I'm gonna tell it here is when you see this script block, so everything from here to here, execute what's in there. So in this case, I'm selecting the URL and then I'm taking this block and saying execute that code and you see this dollar underscore? That's what's called an automatic variable. It represents the current object. So if I were uh, dumping out multiple uh, uh, site collections in there, for instance, it's gonna iterate over them. Dollar underscore just says, take that current object. So here I got an SP site object. Give me the usage storage property, divide it by one gigabyte. So I can do uh, one uh, kilobyte, one megabyte, whatever here. So it's just a cool little shorthand in PowerShell so that I don't have to do the math to convert the byte value that comes back with storage into a gigabyte value. I can just divide it by one gig and I'm good. Or I can use, you know, it's called a hash table, if I wanna provide a label. So in this case, my label would be this big string that I've got here. So this is just a format string. Uh, zero is the, my placeholder. If I had multiple, it'd be zero, one, two, three, et cetera. And this just says I want it two decimals. Right? So it's just like in C-sharp, if you're doing a, a format, string dot format, putting a format string in there, the same thing, except I take my string, dash F, and then the value that I want to go in there. If I want to provide a label with that, I use a hash table, and the, do, the way you create a hash table is you uh, use the uh, at sign, and then the curly braces for a script block, and it's key value pairs. So something, my property, my key equals something else, my value, semicolon, et cetera. So in this case, the select statement wants a specific key. Uh, e for expression is my key, so I can use either E or the word expression, and then L for label or the word label. Those are my keys. And then whatever the value is. So, and in this case, I think I've just, yeah, so here you go, All right? So, okay. And if you guys have questions as I'm going, feel free to interrupt. I know I'm kind of going fast, but uh, like I said, there's a lot of, lot of material. <laughs> uh, filtering objects, so now I've, I've got a list of lists or webs or sites, but I only want a subset of those so I can operate on them. To do that, we use the where object commandlet. And again, this is alias as where or the question mark. Uh, if you're writing scripts, 
I would use either where or where object, not the question mark. Uh, when I'm in the console, I'm trying to reduce my keystrokes, so I'm always, almost always using the question mark. <coughs> but this is basically going to filter objects in the pipeline for you. So what I can do is I'm going to run some commandlet, and this may be a string of commandlets or piped things or whatever, but the point is I'm taking something, and now I'm saying I want to filter that something to something less. So I'm going to call where object, and then I'm going to put a script block in there. And this is my filter, so whatever that expression is. And then I'm going to pipe that out to something. Now this may be gone, in which case I'm piping it to the console. Uh, but usually you want to do something with it if you're filtering it. Well, although it might be just a report, so you may be just dumping it to the console. So in this example here, I'm saying give me all the site collections. So get SP site limit all. So this is uh, regard, uh, ignore the 20, uh, the uh, default limit of 20 site collections that would be returned. And there's uh, some very important memory considerations around there, which I don't have time to get into. Uh, but if you do have questions, let me know. But again, uh, uh, if you're a developer, you should be familiar with disposal issues. So think about that for a little bit. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to pipe that into get SP web limit all. So I'm going to effectively, with these first two commands are going to do, is give me every SP web object in my entire farm. So again, if you're familiar with disposal issues, that should be like, you know, oh my god, why are you doing that? So, um, and now I'm going to go ahead and say I'm going to filter that down. And dollar underscore, as I mentioned earlier, is the current uh, object within that pipeline, within that iteration. So again, this is, almost works like a loop. So I'm taking all these and I'm looping over them and saying, OK, look at each one. And I only want the ones where the web template equals blog. So what I'll get back is that subset now. So like say I was doing something and I needed a report. Here we got our collaboration environment. Who is creating blog sites within there? Where are they? I can run this command. I can inspect my entire farm and quickly find out where all the blog sites are within my environment. What I've been doing this a lot for is in upgrade preparation for all the uh, workspace templates that are now deprecated in 2013. And so there's several templates that have been deprecated, shouldn't be using them anymore. So we're trying to identify them and figure out what we're going to do with them. Are we going to go ahead and let them upgrade or just delete those guys and not worry about it? Uh, so yeah, this is just going through what I said earlier. And this here uh, is it's called an operator. So again, C sharp guys, equal, equal. Yeah, that doesn't work here. It's a dash equal. There's a whole mess of operators that we have available to us. This is a short list. It's not all of them. Uh, there's an, actually, if you type uh, help about operators, it'll give you the full list of the, the ones that are available to you uh, about underscore operators. But again, the format's pretty simple. Dash equal, dash not equal, dash LT, right? So, so variables, we've already seen some variables in some of the examples going through. But all variables start with a, a dollar sign. And there are some built-in, uh, it's called automatic variables. So the dollar underscore is one that we've seen already. So again, as we're working within the pipeline, we're going to use that guy a lot. And uh, there's some improvement with that in uh, PowerShell v3, but not so much. Um, true, false, if I want to set, for instance, the list no crawl property to true, if I do list dot no crawl equals true, that's going to fail. It needs to be equals dollar true. So dollar true is a built-in variable that uh, PowerShell understands and it knows that this is a Boolean. Uh, same thing with dollar false, dollar null. So again, same thing, just null alone would not work. You need that dollar sign. And then there's a lot of built-in variables that give you information about your environment. So home, for instance, tells me what the path to my, uh, my home directory is. Uh, error gives me information about the errors that have occurred. So this is really good if you're writing a script and it generated a whole mess of errors and you want to go back and look at an error. This is a collection. So uh, error zero is my last error that occurred, error one, second to last, et cetera. So I can get all those exception details and dig into it. Uh, again, and there's a, a lot more automatic variables. Uh, if you type help about underscore automatic underscore variables, that'll give you details about those. So in this case here, I'm assigning a variable uh, called department. And I'm going to use that now in a script that I'm going to use to basically create a, cycle, a uh, web, I think I'm doing here. Yeah. So 
Imagine where you're creating a script and you want to write out some uh, information about what's going on before you create it, after you create it, and whatnot. So I'm going to use the write host commandlet. So this is going to write some text to the console. And notice here how I'm just embedding that variable directly in the string. I don't need to do any string concatenation or anything like that. It just knows that there's a dollar sign. That's a variable. I'm good to go. Just put it in there. Now I'm going to go ahead, create my site. And again, I'm doing the same thing, just embedding that variable directly in the string. Uh, in this case, I'm using it straight up. There's no string there. And this is where it gets a little tricky. Now I want to say, OK, well, I've created it. And this is the URL. Well, if I just put $web.url, what I'd get is a two-string value of an spweb dot URL in the, the message that came out. It would ignore that. It wouldn't realize that this is a, a part of a longer thing that I'm trying to do. So what I do is I wrap that in dollar paren. So dollar open paren, close paren. It's just called a sub-expression. Right? So think of math, order of operation. Right? So I'm telling PowerShell, this what I have in here. Go ahead and, and evaluate the contents of this guy first, and then go ahead and dump that into my string. Quick demo. Okay, so what I wanted to do real quick is just show you some of these things running just so you can see what the, uh, the output is like. Um, one thing to point out, this is, so I'm on my SharePoint 2013 environment, and this is uh, the new PowerShell ISC. These regions that I've got, this is new uh, with, the, um, uh, with, with PowerShell v3. And I also have things like IntelliSense, so I can do get command tab, and then it'll show me all the parameters. So we did not have this with v2. So if you're still in SharePoint 2010, the IntelliSense and the regions and a few other things are, are not there. So if I were to go ahead and run this, so you're going to see here now I got a big dump of all the commandlets that uh, are available to me. And again, there's, there's quite a few, so it can be hard to pick through this list. So for me, running this, you know, it's interesting from an academic standpoint, but it doesn't really tell you anything because I don't personally like digging through 800 commandlets to see what's there. Uh, but I can do something similar here. I can say, okay, well, just show me all the uh, commandlets that uh, start with the, the verb get and have sp star in there, which again, it's kind of an academic example. Uh, or I can do the same thing here. So these two results will give me the exact same information. But what's probably more useful is if I do something again, like uh, um, get, uh, see, uh, get command star services. Right? So I can see all the commandlets that have the word services in there, or service, or whatever. So if I'm trying to figure out what's going on with uh, uh, some of the, the service commandlets that are available. Right, or maybe I'm looking for the access services commandlets, right? So I can type get star access star or access services star or something like that. So in terms of permissions, if we look here, so I haven't given this guy access, but this is a SQL Server, my config DB. And you'll see this role here. Right now, just the SP Farm account has access to that. And similarly, if I come over here to my local WS admin WPG group, uh, I get my admin account, my SP farm, SP services, so what you'd expect to be in there. Now, if I come in here and run this command, this is going to add the user into my config database. So now if I come into this, you'll see that shell admin account is, is now in that role. And again, if I come into the local group, he is there as well. So I didn't have to manually add them in there. It's done for me, uh, basically, uh, by the, uh, the, well, the account that I'm running as has to have those permissions. So the idea is when you provision in the farm, um, your setup account, install account, whatever you, you call them here, I'm calling them SP admin, has full control. And I'm going to take a user or more ideally a group. So I've called it here shell admins. and. At, give them appropriate permissions. And then from an IT standpoint, I can move users in and out of that group. So the way I typically do it is it's kind of a one-time setup, and then I just move people in and out of my shell admins group rather than messing with SharePoint. Uh, this guy here, so if I call just get database, get us be database, you'll see it's going to give me the list of all my databases. Uh, one thing you should uh, note here, let's see. It's hard to see on this, but 
Let's see. So, uh, anybody see any GUIDs? No? Yeah. yeah. You need to use PowerShell to do that. So, anyways, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and add this guy now into all my databases. So if I were to go now and look in one of my other databases, uh, let's just grab one here. Security rules, these rules, shell access. I'll see that he's now in there as well. So this just iterated through all those databases that were returned and add him in, added him into there. If I remove him though, <laughs> you'll note that he is still in this group, right? And again, okay, well, let's remove him from all databases and I might get an error on this one. So the reason I get an error there is because I've already removed him from the config database, and this is saying he doesn't exist. What are you doing? Um, if you don't like that error, you could just say error action silently continue. Run that, and I don't get any errors. It's, uh, <laughs> and let's see. I'll show you actually if I if I do that. So. And let's, let's get rid of this. So, still get those errors in this case. But, uh, so, yeah, so in this case, it actually is reporting an error back to me, which is good. But more times than not, I find when I do that, what if, it would just come back and say, yeah, you're good. So, uh, so this is, I guess, one in which they actually did it proper. Uh, but anyways, as you can see now, he is uh, still in that admin group. So it's just uh, kind of a minor little gotcha. If you're thinking you're pulling somebody out, you, they may in fact still have permissions. And this WSS admin group has quite a bit of permissions. So just kind of watch out for that. Clear this. Okay. So let's take a look at the help. So if I run help get SP site, it's going to take a second. And the, the delay there is actually because it's trying to make a quick online attempt to see if there's any um, uh, additional help. So it sometimes uh, takes an additional second. But you see here I get a, you know, the name, quick synopsis, parameters. So you notice these blocks of, of parameters here. So there's a little space between them. These are called parameter sets. Basically, it just shows the different ways in which I can call uh, this commandlet. So uh, sometimes some parameters just don't make sense in the context of others. So, and I get my little description and some remarks, related links. But what if I want to see uh, details about those individual parameters or uh, the, the uh, examples and whatnot that are available? If I just pass in full, you see I get a lot more information. So I get examples of how to call it. So there's a ton of examples in there. I get information about each parameter, so whether it accepts a value through the pipeline, what the description is, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Some of the help, not so good. Um, TechNet is definitely more up to date. Uh, some of it is flat out wrong. Um, uh, for example, export SP web, import SP web tells you you can export and import a web application. That's wrong. Um, so there's just a few things here and there. Sometimes, particularly with the um, uh, with 2013, this is more so the case during the preview, not so much now that it's released. But the, uh, the help and the parameters that it showed didn't actually line up with what was truly there. Uh, so the, the way PowerShell works, there's an XML file that defines the help, uh, and it's just looking at that. So if that XML file is out of sync with the binaries, then you're going to see different things. So if you want to see what's really there, use the get command commandlet, pass in uh, your commandlet name, and then dash syntax. And what this will do is actually use reflection to look at the actual class that defines that commandlet and then dump out the parameters that are there. So if you're trying to run a command and it's saying, you know, that parameter doesn't exist and you're clearly seeing that it does exist in the help, that's, that's what's going on there. So just use this commandlet and you'll see what's actually there. Uh, I'm not going to run this because I don't have an internet connection, but it doesn't work with SharePoint anyways. So this is a PowerShell v3 thing. It says, go and look online to see if there's updated help and download it. So it works great for the out-of-the-box Windows PowerShell commandlets. SharePoint does not support that, so it doesn't know anything about it. So you can run that, but it's not going to help you with SharePoint. 
And all right, last one real quick. So in this example here, I'm taking my SP web application, piping that to get, get SP site and get SP web, and I'm going to return back all the webs in that web application, uh, in which case I think I just have one. So it might take a second to run, but I'm pretty sure this environment, I've only got the one. Come on. And sometimes it takes a little while. <laughs> All right, so while that's running, the, the next example here, what I was going to do is just uh, grab a single web. Actually, let me just kill this because I don't have time to wait for it. Um, I'm going to set this to a variable. And then what I wanted to do is just dump out the list that are available. So imagine where you're just trying to see maybe what the URL, the titles, some basic properties and whatnot. Um, if you notice, the output is not very, oh, bug it. OK, so <laughs> you're seeing a nice clean output here because I uh, accidentally loaded my commandlets. So um, my custom stuff fixes this. <laughs> uh, if I didn't have my stuff installed, what you would see is uh, this would still be running, and it would be running about five minutes from now as it tries to continuously dump out a ton of information, basically every single property on that site collection. And the problem is the schema properties get kind of big. So it's not that the command itself takes a long time to run, but the console takes very long to actually update and display all that information. So when I ran this earlier this morning, um, after about three minutes of it just can still dumping out all the list information, I killed it. Um, so what I wanted to show is, OK, here's a lot of information. I was going to kill it. And then here's how you can now take that and get uh, simpler information. So in this case, I want to just get the, uh, the list and the, uh, the titles, the item count, and what my root folder is. So you can see here, you know, I got my title, the title of that list, how many items in it, and what the root folder is for it. So again, properties, and this is a hash table with an expression, so I can drill down and get that server relative URL. I could also use a for each command that I'm not really going to show that right now because uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit, or the where. Uh, commit, where object command lit, for instance, so that I can uh, filter those results. So just show me uh, item count less than 50, which I'm not even sure I have any in there. Yeah, I do got a couple. Uh, so 50 is a stupid low number, not really useful, but think of this more like, I don't know, 5,000. So that number should mean something to you. Uh, so show me all the lists where, you know, basically my large list. Where do I have more than 5,000 items? Where are my potential uh, large list thresh threshold issues? So I could take this and basically do this across the entire farm to figure out that, that kind of information. Okay. Okay. So scripting, we're moving out of the console. Now we want to do something um, and basically make it reusable. Scripts are all about I've done something once and I want to do it again lots of times. Um, so there's a few things that we need to, to know. Usually, if we're getting into scripting, we're going to be building some more complex logic, conditional logic, iteration loops, that kind of stuff. So conditional logic, I want to perform a given task when the expression evaluates to true. I got a couple uh, uh, key options here. Uh, if, else, if, else, no different than in C Sharp if you're doing it, with the exception of no space between the two. That's it. Everything's exactly the same. Uh, switch statement, it's a little bit different, but again, if you're familiar with C-sharp, exactly the same. Switch, some value to evaluate, and then on the, uh, the values that I want to consider, the script block, we're going to execute my code. Uh, there's a break keyword. I didn't show it in here. If you don't put the break keyword in here, um, I can, you know, for instance, if value 1 and value 2 both make sense. So these values don't have to be like strings or objects. I can put a script block in there. This can be an expression that is evaluated against this expression. Right, so I can fall into multiple cases here. Um, so if I fall into one and I don't want the other cases to be considered, use the break keyword to exit out. So that will be the, uh, the last line in your script block. And then I can have a default code section. So everything in here will get executed if I didn't meet any of these conditions. Uh, iteration, so there's a lot of different options here. And again, this is really no different than uh, C Sharp for the developers in the group. So uh, while uh, syntax, I'm basically going to say, uh, while something is true, do something. So in this particular example, um, or, or with this particular construct, there may be a case in which 
no code is ever executed. So here I'm basically just you know looping ten times and outputting the the value of i, right? So it's always going to execute. But um, but again, imagine there's some expression in here that it will evaluate to true or false. If it immediately evaluates to false, then that code will never run. If I need the code to run at least once, I'll use a do while. So here, do this code while this expression is true. So that will always execute at least once, regardless of what the expression <laughs> is. Oh, come on. <coughs> Sorry. Technical difficulties. All right, well, so much for that. Um, come on. My whole. Okay. Well, that was weird. <laughs> okay. Uh, do until, uh, did I talk about that one? Okay, it's, it's basically the same as do while, but the condition is, is the reverse. So um, again, effectively the same, you're just reversing that condition. So here, these two things are gonna do the exact same, uh, same thing. Here I'm saying do while i is less than 10, and do this one until i is greater than 10, greater than or equal to 10. So the result is exactly the same. Uh, for loop, this basically says, uh, take some initialization expression Increment that expression by some value, do something, until this uh, end condition is met. So set i to 0. I'm going to increment i by 1. So this is just a shorthand notation to increment it by 1. And do that until i is less than 10. Anything within the script block here is going to execute. I almost never use that. I mean, I use that a lot in C Sharp, but in PowerShell, I never use that. So what I use usually is this, so the for each uh, <coughs> construct. So if I got a collection, I want to say for each object in that collection, do this. So in this case, this is a shorthand notation for an array, uh, 0 dot dot 9. So I'm saying give me 9 or 10 values uh, and just iterate through that array and do something. Functions, so I want to take some bit of code, some uh, abstract piece of reusable code and move that into this, this uh, function that I can call over and over again. Uh, so I don't want to duplicate that code 10 times. I want to have it just once and call it 10 times. So I'm going to create a function, give it a name, and I got a parameter uh, list so I can pass in uh, different values and whatnot. And I'm going to have some code and an optional return. So my function may or may not return something. I can also have my function write out to the pipeline. I don't recommend you do that because I can get confused in as far as what am I returning versus what am I writing to the pipeline because it, it does the same thing. So if I'm right into the pipeline, so I've got uh, something where I, I called maybe just get SP site and it dumps it out to the pipeline and I also have a return, I'm going to get what get SP site dumped out and the return value together as an array. I can name and call functions, or I should name and call functions, just like a commandlet. So rather than you know, just some arbitrary name, I want that verb dash noun syntax for those functions. Because the way you use a function is just like a commandlet. So I'm gonna, if I have a parameter here, dollar $list, dollar $enable, I can pass it in positionally like this, or I can do dash $list, $list, dash $enable, true, whatever. Right? So again, the way you call it, just like a commandlet, so you should try to name it just like a commandlet. Um, oh, and uh, functions can contain functions. So it's a good way to actually, uh, it's almost like marking a function is internal. So if you've got a large group, a uh, large function, you can put a function within that and it won't be accessible to anything outside of that function. Function parameters can be uh, ex either implicit or explicit. And this is sort of my terminology. Um, this is what I'm kind of referring to as sort of a, a, an implicit parameter. Um, the PowerShell documentation just calls them parameters. And what they call explicit parameters are advanced parameters. Uh, this is an example of that. So basically, instead of defining it within the parens here, I'm going to use a param keyword and define each one on a separate line. There's some advantages to doing that. It all comes down to basically how I can decorate those parameters. Um, but uh, one quick note, I can optionally prefix a parameter with a type. So the way I, I defined a type in PowerShell, 
is I'll use a, a put the value in brackets. So square bracket, string, close bracket, and that defines a type. Uh, it's also useful for statics. So if you need to call, um, for instance, uh, the, the static is null or empty on the string, I do uh, bra square bracket, string, close bracket, colon, colon, is null or empty. So colon, double colon is how you access statics in PowerShell. What's up? It depends on what you're doing. Um, if I'm writing just something really quick, I just use the, the implicit. If I'm writing something that I'm going to reuse a lot, or I'm going to ship, or I'm writing it for somebody else, I always use explicit. And this is a little easier now in uh, V3 with the ISC because there's some um, uh, uh, snippets in there that you can just right click something and it'll give you the template for that and you just plug in the values. So here's an example of sort of the benefits. So I can make my function work a lot more like a commandlet. So here, I'm adding this attribute called commandlet binding. I'm telling it that, okay, I want these attributes. Consider them just as though you would any other parameter for any kind of out of the box compiled commandlet. Once I do that, now I can go and I can start decorating it. So here, I'm marking this parameter as a parameter. So again, this is just an attribute just like you would do in C Sharp. I'm saying it's mandatory, so I don't have to write any code now to say, okay, is this value empty? Did they provide it? If they didn't provide a value for this list parameter, it'll throw an error for me, and I don't have to write any code for that. Uh, and then I'm setting the position, so I want always, if they don't provide the attribute name, or the parameter name itself, rather, then I want this to be position zero, this to be position one. And then here, in this case, what if they provide the list parameter, but they put in a null value for it? Well, this says, yeah, that ain't going to fly either, so go ahead and throw that as an error. And there's a whole mess of additional uh, attributes that you can decorate these parameters with. Uh, there's quite a few of them, actually. So if you type help about underscore functions, underscore advanced, underscore parameters, uh, it'll give you examples of all this, as well as all the additional attributes that you can apply. Like I said, there's quite a few. Okay, so a script, basically just a function uh, known by a file. So when I create a, a script file, uh, which will have a PS1 uh, file extension, typically, technically it doesn't have to, but it uh, should, um, it's really no different than, than putting something in a function. That script itself is a function. That means that uh, the script itself can also have parameters. So I don't have to declare a function in there. I can create parameters right at the top. It would have to be uh, the explicit or advanced parameters, um, but, uh, but I can do that. So I can call my script at the, the uh, command prompt at the console, and then the, the file, and then pass parameters into it, just like I would like an executable where you pass an args into it. It's no different. Uh, so yeah, so it can have uh, lots of different functions, but doesn't have to have any. And the way you load the script, there's two ways. Um, typically, though, you're going to use what's called dot source notation. So if you've just created standard functions, you put those in those scripts, your scripts, and you want those functions to be available to you at the console or in another script. So if you've got a script load in a script, you use dot source notation to load in. What that is is you basically just do a dot, a period, space, and then the file name. So in this example here, I got a couple different ones. Uh, so there's, it's hard to see, but there's a space here. So it's dot space and then the, uh, the absolute path to my script file. And in this case, I'm using a relative path. So dot space, the relative path. So either way, it'll do the same thing. If you don't dot source it, so if I omit that, it'll load that script, but all of my functions will be internal to the script. You won't be able to use them in the console, so you're not going to see them. So if you load this script and you go and you try to run a function within that, uh, within that script and you're saying, it's giving you an error saying, yeah, it doesn't exist, it's probably because you just forgot to dot source it. What you want to be careful, though, is scripts that just execute, so scripts that don't contain any functions. So I right click, say execute that script, and it actually does do something. That can be kind of dangerous because depending on how people's environments are set up, they, uh, they double click that script, it may load it in the editor or it may actually execute the script. And depending on what that script is doing, you may not really want that thing executed just randomly like that. So what I always do is when I create a script, I'll put a function around that. So I effectively am requiring a two-step process. Load that script into memory and then execute the function. It's just kind of a good safety 
measure to keep somebody from shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, you can make scripts available without dot sourcing. So if you want to uh, make that uh, function rather uh, available so that if they forget to dot source it, just add a scope identifier. In this case, my, uh, my function, whatever the name is, I'm just adding global colon. And this tells PowerShell, oh, okay, they want this, this function available everywhere. So in that case, I don't have to dot source it. And again, recommended that you name your script files just like uh, your, your um, a commandlet, so verb dash noun. Doesn't always make sense to do that, but where you can, it's a, it, what I found it helps me do is actually be better at about abstracting functionality out to different scripts rather than trying to put too much stuff into one script. So if I have to think about a verb noun a name for my script, if I got the script doing a ton of stuff, usually I'm like, all right, I need to break that up because I got it doing too much stuff and it'll be easier to manage if I break that up into different files. So if you think about that, it's a good way to kind of force yourself to do it. Okay, and I think I'm running way over here. So uh, error handling, just like in C Sharp, uh, try catch finally. Finally is uh, optional, catch is not. Uh, I can catch different errors, whatever. Um, let's see, I'm gonna blow through some of this stuff real quick here. And all I wanted to show you with this is just a quick example of a script. So this script, uh, you know, this, this is a, the way you do comments in uh, uh, PowerShell. All I did to create this so this is PowerShell v3. It gave me the template, and I just filled in the blanks. Right? So in this case, this particular script gives me all the list sizes. So I got a parameter I can pass in a, uh, a web. And I want to be able to take things. I want this function to be able to support the pipeline. So I have this uh, begin and process section. Begin executes once. Process executes for every item within the pipeline. And then I'm going to loop through all of the, uh, those lists and then basically just build a hash table of all my data. This then takes that hash table and pivots it. So let me, um, if you guys have any questions about this, I can show you later. But I wanted to just really quick touch upon some of the, the uh, new stuff in V3. And again, I apologize I'm running late if, if people need to take off. Uh, I'm going to spend like two minutes on this just to give you a really quick overview. Uh, V3 and SharePoint 2010. Yeah, there's nothing. So uh, technically there is something, but it's all about what you can't do, right? So it's not supported. If you're trying to run PowerShell V3 in 2010, you can't. Um, uh, you can use it on your 2010 box, but as soon as you install it, now you're not going to be able to run the commandlets unless you use a side-by-side -side mode. So you'd have to run your PowerShell uh, console and pass in version 2, and this tells it to load the old version of PowerShell so you can still run your commandlets. But you're not going to get any of the new stuff. So when we're talking about uh, PowerShell v3, we're really talking about SharePoint 2013. I'm not going to go into any of the specific stuff with 2013 um, because it's really no different from a PowerShell standpoint. All it is is we've got uh, a few less commandlets than 2010, so 42 commandlets removed, a whole mess added, about 300, uh, many changed, and we've got a whole mess that I don't even cover. So the 800, that just includes, of course, SharePoint ones. This doesn't include distributed cache and workflow, which have their own commandlets, a whole different set. Uh, show command, let me just show you that really quick. This is kind of cool if you're learning. I can do show command, get sb site. This gives me a little dialog with my different parameter sets. And I can just fill in those values and I can either run it or copy it to the clipboard. Um, if I don't pass in a uh, commandlet and just run that, Okay, that usually doesn't happen. <laughs> okay, well, what that would normally do is provide. You see this on the right here? That's what it would have brought up, basically just a list of all the commandlets that are available to me. So uh, we've already been looking at the new IAC, so. Oh 
Okay, oh, let's start again. All right, so we've been looking at, sorry guys. My PowerShell deck just keeps getting stuck. <laughs> okay, um, really quick member enumeration. Uh, let's get through this. So uh, V2, if I wanted to, uh, for instance, get all the URLs, I could use a select object commandlet, or I could use, this is a, a, an alias for for each object, and get all the URLs. Now I can just put this in parens and do dot URL. So this is actually really useful if you're trying to pass information into something else. Uh, every object now has a count property. Again, useful if you're writing scripts and you're trying to figure out, do I have an array, do I, do I not have an array, how many items are within there? Um, so it doesn't have to be a collection just to have that count property. Uh, null has a count property, it's a count of zero. Uh, almost every object has an indexer, so if I want to index into an array, I can do that. Null is the exception, it doesn't have that. And uh, I mentioned a uh, dollar underscore is a little bit better in uh, V3, only because they added an alias of dollar PS item. Okay. <laughs> Okay, variables, uh, we talked about advanced uh, functions and I can put attributes on parameters. With V3, now I can do it on variables. So if I want to make sure that my dollar $x is, falls within a particular range, I can use the validate range attribute. Not really good in this example, but think about x coming from a user or you know, some function or something like that. Uh, custom options, I'm gonna skip that one. Okay, iteration and filters here. This is really what I consider a bug in V2. If I do for each object, I in null like this, and then I'll put something, I get that value. Right? So a lot of people get tripped up on this because they pass in a null value uh, into their for each, so maybe they have an expression here. They have something that did a, a get and it returned back null, and they want to iterate over that collection, and all of a sudden that collection executed. So that, to me, is a bug in V2. That's fixed in V3. Where you got to watch out for that is if you take a script that you wrote for V3, and you're not putting a uh, if null con you know, continue or break check in there, then it, that script may break or do something uh, unexpected if you move it down to v2. So watch out for that. Uh, where object for each object, automatic variables. This has improved a little bit. So this would be v2, get SB site where dollar underscore compatibility level equals 15. I could do the same thing here in v3. I can omit the dollar underscore, I can omit the script block, and I can just say where the compatibility level is equal 15. So it just reads a little nicer. Um, and I can do the same thing here uh, with a for each object. Uh, background jobs, I had background jobs in V2, but I couldn't schedule them. So if I had a long running task, I could create a job until it could run in the background. Now I can schedule it. So think uh, task scheduler, Windows task scheduler. This is really, really helpful for uh, automated governance where you've got some job that you want to run behind the scenes and execute some PowerShell script. What's cool about this is if you were using a, a, the task scheduler to do it, any output that your script generates, you're gonna have to write code to account for that. With this, I don't have to do that because all my output is gonna be stored with that job information. So all I have to do is create that job, schedule it, and I don't have to change my script. It'll work and behave exactly as it would as though I were in the console. So all the output that I would see if I ran that in the console is gonna be saved as part of that job. Now I can go back and retrieve that job and view those console, those, uh, that output. Uh, this is just a real quick example. I created a trigger, so I'm saying I want this job to run daily at 3 a.m. Give me the credentials that I want it to run as, and uh, an initialization script. So here I'm saying go ahead and load the out of the box SharePoint PS1 script, and I just kind of abbreviated that so it'd be uh, you know, under the SharePoint root. So I need to make sure my, my snap in is loaded. And then I'm gonna go ahead and register that job, give it a name, pass my trigger and credential and initialization script, and then run this script at that schedule. All right, last slide, uh, workflow. V3 basically supports the workflow engine now. So I can create complex workflows within PowerShell. Um, I can schedule those workflows that have them run at certain times. The trick with this, when I, I could write a book on this, it's a big topic, so I only have one slide and really no time. <laughs> but uh, uh, instead of function, I use the workflow keyword. Parameters, everything looks the same here. For each, what I'm doing here is this simple example. Let's say I've got a site feature that I need to activate on 40,000 site collections. I don't want that to run one after the other. I want to run as many of them as I can you know, in parallel. So here I'm saying for each URL that's passed in, run that in parallel. Do as many as you can and run this inline script block. So why do I need that inline script block? 
because everything within here is a custom action. So if I have a commandlet, if you see anything in, in that workflow, it's not a commandlet, it's an action. It's an action that wraps the commandlet. Inline script is needed because Power SharePoint doesn't know anything about the workflow stuff. There are no built-in actions. So out of the box, Windows PowerShell has a get process commandlet. They also have a get process uh, action that wraps the get process commandlet. So when I run inline script, it's actually spawned a new process and running the contents of that for me in that script. Uh, yeah, last thing, the, this using keyword, so I'm passing in these variables. This is in a different script, so I need to tell the workflow engine that I want these variables available in that new process. So that's what the using uh, scope identifier is for there. And, all right, cool. So uh, additional resources, uh, my blog, buy my book, it's right there if you want to take a look at it. I'll hang around for a little bit. Uh, PowerShell.com is actually a good place for a lot of generic PowerShell tips. And then um, I have a PowerShell cheat sheet, which some of you grabbed copies of, I ran out of, but uh, I do have it as a PDF online, and there's the, the URL for it, so tinyurl.com uh, slash posh cheat. So uh, PowerShell cheat. All right. um, uh, yeah, and that's it. Thank you, I'm sorry I ran over. <laughs>